This week on the Energy Savers, Earth Sheltered Housing. Welcome to the Energy Savers. I'm Jacob Quinlog, your host. Today we're going to be discussing Earth Sheltered Housing. This is a subject in which I hold more than a casual interest since I am a designer and builder of passive solar earth sheltered buildings. During the past few years of promoting this unique energy conserving alternative, I've been confronted with many questions and doubts about underground living. It's not surprising that people would be skeptical in light of all the poorly designed basement spaces which exist today. It is true that many existing underground spaces are poorly constructed, inadequately waterproofed, lack natural light and ventilation, and are anything but what you would want to call home. The good news is that with present technology and good common sense building techniques, earth sheltered homes can be totally problem free and can provide far better shelter than conventionally constructed homes. One has to take a serious look at a home that can provide up to 90% reduction in heating and cooling costs, is virtually fireproof, offers built in storm protection, lower insurance risk, and is practically maintenance free. Many families have moved to earth sheltered homes in recent years and their positive experiences have generated enormous public interest. We'll show you some of these homes and focus on the features which make up a successful earth sheltered design. With us today is Brent Anderson, an architectural engineer from the Underground Space Center at the University of Minnesota. Welcome, Brent. Thank you, Jacob. Certainly a pleasure to be here today. What I'd like to do is, first of all, begin talking about some of the myths that people have about earth sheltered housing in particular, talk about soils. I think that something we should realize is that the soil is not necessarily a great insulator. A lot of people think that the soil has some kind of intrinsic insulating value. Um, I think we should realize that soil has an R factor of about one and a half per foot. And if people don't realize it, putting a foot, two feet of soil on the roof of your structure is going to do very little in order to stop the heat. But what soil is, is a temperature moderator. And if we look at the diagram, we can see that typically in our above ground houses, we're dealing with outside temperatures below 30 degrees, indoor temperatures around 68 degrees. That's a 100 degree temperature swing. Now, when we get underground, you can see that, let's say the average soil about 48 degrees, we can see that now we have a temperature swing of about 20 degrees. And so the real important thing about soils is that, it's, that it's more of a temperature moderator than necessarily an insulator. Other things that I think we should realize about earth sheltered housing, in particular, is they offer many advantages that we don't normally necessarily have in conventional housing. Number one is um, protection from high winds, tornadoes, and things on that. A lot of people, like in the Oklahoma areas, build specifically for tornado protection. This is kind of the result of what happens in a conventional above ground stick type building. Um, you can see the, the damage, the disaster, and the earth shelter structure, which is generally bermed into the soil, concrete construction, generally very well protected in the case of high winds. Another advantage, which should be quite clear if you're building out of concrete construction, is the fact that essentially concrete materials won't burn. Many people have been offered uh, lower insurance ratings for the use of concrete construction. And perhaps, as you'd mentioned to me a little earlier, you had um, had some comments on that. Yeah, I'm familiar with one family who's uh, successfully insured just those components of their home which can be destroyed by fire or windstorm, and thereby lowering approximately 30% their mm -hmm. basic uh, insurance risk. Yeah, I've heard many examples of that also, where people have had 20 to 30% reductions um, in their fire insurance ratings due to the fact that they went earth sheltered. A lot of people have a, a misconception, I think, and I think you realize this too, of what earth sheltered housing is. I think that the Clark Nelson house, as you see here in River Falls, Wisconsin, was one of the earlier examples that seemed to be pictured in all the books. And anytime somebody bought a book on earth sheltered housing, they saw this, they, they formed this opinion that earth sheltered housing was some tube or some kind of circular structure. A lot of times it appealed to some people, other times it didn't appeal to people. But this kind of conception that it's always a tube, there's only a little bit of window area in it is really not true. Many people usually when they see homes see, have this connotation that all earth sheltered homes are one story. Well, generally there's a reason that most earth sheltered homes are one story. The reason being that typically they're, they're much more 
um, cost effective. Two-story earth sheltered homes have a tendency to accumulate a lot of cost in retaining walls. And as the design, as you see here, is a two-story earth sheltered home built quite um, economically. The, the row of glass on the very top is actually clear story windows that are protected. And then the main story with the deck in front, one side is the living room, the other side is the dining kitchen area, and then the bedroom spaces are below. Now it looks like that some of the bedroom spaces are, are essentially hidden, and that's because the picture was taken towards the base of a hill. That's on a slight knoll, and um, so I have a standing lower. But it's a very, very attractive house. It was sold, I think, within like the first week it was opened up. A lot of financing people questioned whether earth sheltered housing would really sell. And they had six offers of the home within the first week, and I think they took one right away. And um, Very good. in actuality, I think the value of that home has went up um, 20 to 30 percent in the last couple of years. It's, it's actually, I think, assumed more value. In other words, gained a higher rate of value than the homes within the other areas. And this was a spec home. Right? And this was a spec home, right. I see. Now let's go to a, a little different type of scale. This is what is typically done. Um, this is in De Pere, Wisconsin. It's an earth sheltered home. It's approximately uh, 1,200 square feet. It was sold, I think, for $56,000. It was, you know, it was very much in the range of the average middle class person. Two car garage. It, you see in the front is the living room and then the master bedroom off to the end. Now, they haven't planted it yet with grass, but that will be there within a few more months, and I think it's going to be a very, very attractive site. The other thing to note is this was built right at grade, flat site, and then they burned the soil up around it. Another myth that most people have is you must have a south-facing sloped lot, and that really isn't true. Here's a shot from the inside. This is taken of the living room area. Um, you can see the windows that do face south, the, um, the masonry material in the floor for passive gain. It's basically an all-concrete house. The roof is precast concrete. The walls are poured concrete with a sheetrock um, glued to the wall. Now, a lot of people, as we talked before, generally will plaster finish the walls. But um, I think as a homeowner, if you went inside of an earth sheltered house, you would be unable to tell whether it was a stud wall, you know, made out of two by fours and sheetrock, or it was actually a concrete wall. This next example is in another earth sheltered home in the Wisconsin area. Now this is a passive greenhouse that is in the front of the house. And they have the greenhouse set up so not only is it a greenhouse to collect energy, but is also essentially set up so that it um, functions as a recreational room in the house. And you can see the use of brick on the side walls to capture the sun's energy. It's a tiled floor. They have a rock bed system under right underneath that floor so that they can collect the heat and store it in the rock bed. Um, I think it's a, it's a very beautiful addition onto their house. Underground houses do lend themselves to passive solar design fairly easily, don't they? Oh, yes. I think that probably earth sheltered housing is probably one of the most interesting ways and probably the best way to use passive design is because passive design, first of all, you must collect the energy and the second of all, you must be able to store the energy. And using the concrete materials, the heavy mass of concrete is, is really a natural for passive design. Now this is that same house. This is as we get a little deeper into the house. And a couple of interesting things to point out here. Notice the columns, as you see, um, in the background with the curves. Those are actually the, con the poured concrete columns. And then they furred them out with um, sheet rocking to kind of put these smooth curves to them. And I really think it's a rather attractive design. It's 50 feet from the front of that house to the back. And you can see with a skylight, which is in the back of that house, there's a lot of natural light pouring into the space. Another um, myth that I think most people have is that earth sheltered homes are always dark. And in reality, I've been in a lot of earth sheltered homes that probably there's more so light I. than an above ground That's home. Right. And the other thing is that they're always humid and damp. And with proper ventilation, generally a forced air heating system, um, the humidity problems are not what most people think. Usually. Um, when I talk to people in earth sheltered homes, probably their biggest complaint is that they're too quiet um, or that there's, they're not used to living in a home that's so quiet that when they hear the noise of the refrigerator, you know, it, it really stands out. You know, there's a little adjustment to, to living in an earth sheltered home, but most people 
once they live in one, would never go, you know, otherwise to a conventional home. Now, this isn't probably one of the most beautiful homes, but one thing I will say about this home, and it's very, very efficient. This home has been monitored since December of this year, and essentially what happened was is that the owners moved out for three weeks, okay? And in that period of time, we were going to monitor the home. We left the refrigerator running. It was the only source of energy in the entire house. And in that three-month period, um, the temperature went from 72 degrees down to 46 degrees, okay? And that was as low as the temperature got. And, and our graphs would show the temperature rising up and down frequently as the sun would shine through the windows and warm the space up. And then what we did is that we pulled the drapes um, after the temperature had reached 46 degrees, and the temperature then dropped down to 42 degrees. And then upon opening the drapes, and we'd see the temperature fluctuation go up and down, which was a real vivid indication of what the passive heating was doing for so the structure. With, with no energy added whatsoever, the, there's no fear of freezing in this particular house, is that right? That's right. I think that it, it is safe to say with a properly insulated, properly designed earth sheltered home, you could essentially leave um, in the midst of the winter and come back in spring and not have all your heating pipes frozen and everything else frozen solid. Other things that people commonly ask about earth sheltered homes is do they always have to be concrete? Some people um, like to use and, and like the warmth of wood and brick. And so here's an example of an earth sheltered home, northeastern part of the country, that uses large timber beams and brick and masonry in the interior, which really softens the space. Um, wood can be used as well as concrete. It's just a matter of proper design. Here in this design also, you can see with the south-facing glass, it's a little difficult maybe to see in the front, but there's tile work and stonework across the front to pick up the, the passive energy. Another example of concrete construction, and this is in Waterloo, Iowa. It's not too far away. And um, this is all poured concrete on the walls, which has been plastered, carpeting on the floor, and precast concrete roof. Again, I think that this house is, is very aesthetically pleasing. And I would say that any one of you that went into this house, first of all, being inside, you'd never know you were underground. Second of all, I think that you'd really enjoy the internal aesthetics. It was, it's very well done. This is an all-stone fireplace. It's actually open from the living room. On the other side of that is the kitchen, and they have the stove, which actually um, comes through on both sides, so the heating kind of radiates in two directions. Um, very, very beautiful design. The last example, what we have here today, is one in... Um, Rochester, Minnesota, again, trying to emphasize the point that the concrete construction is certainly a viable alternative. It's poured concrete walls, plaster finished, precast concrete on the roof. This is the living room, the main entry into this home. And even though it was a rather dark day that, that I was out there, there was a lot of natural light pouring into the space. Certainly, uh, one of the problems we deal with most often relating to clients is waterproofing. Everybody seems to have this idea, as we mentioned earlier, that these have to be dark, damp, musty spaces. Uh, could you speak a little bit to the solutions you might offer to the waterproofing problem for underground buildings? Okay. I um, definitely agree that probably waterproofing is the number one technical problem that architects and engineers and home builders have with their sheltered housing. Again, there's another myth. And that is that asphalt and some type of polyethylene material on the outside of the structure is a waterproofing product. And in reality, that's not true. Um, there have been numerous examples of people who had this concept that four feet of earth and, and essentially you wouldn't need waterproofing or you could get by with asphalt are now finding out, and we're seeing them now, pulling the earth off the roof and re-waterproofing, or, or what I should say, waterproofing now for the first time their structures. There have been a number of homes that have leaked because of the use of asphalt for waterproofing. But there are many, many good waterproofing products. There are, there are butyl rubbers, there are EPDM sheets, there are bentonite clays, um, to name three of probably the more popular ones. And my attitude about waterproofing is that 80% of the waterproofing job is in the application. Usually there are good products, it's just a matter of whether they're being applied properly. And so it's of utmost importance, and in particular, if you're a do-it-yourselfer, 
to do a very conscientious job in waterproofing. I see. Are there any other aspects to the whole waterproofing question that you might want to bring out? Well, probably the most important thing in waterproofing is actually in the drainage and the landscaping of the structure. Probably the first thing that you will do is properly landscape the structure. In other words, slope the soil on the roof, slope the ground away from the sides of the structure where it is bermed or if earth comes over the top, slope it away to carry the water away naturally first. Probably the second thing is to provide proper drainage. Okay, when I say proper drainage, I'm usually talking about a drain tile at the base of the footing and typically on a flat roof construction, a drain tile right at the top of the wall. So in other words, generally in my designs, I will have two sets of drain tile, one at the top, one at the bottom. Okay, and so drain tiling and proper slope of the soil are probably more important than actually having the right material because with those, doing those two things, you can take away probably 90% of the water that will ever come near the structure. I see. One of the other things that we uh, have a lot, have trouble uh, describing to people is the use of exterior insulation so that the interior mass of the building uh, is used for heat storage. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the use of exterior insulation? Okay. Um, there is a lot of controversy as to what type of exterior insulation to use, and let's just mention that a second. There are basically three kinds of insulation. There is the beadboard insulation, which is a polystyrene. There's, there's, and that's usually an open cell. There's a closed cell um, insulation, um, which is extruded polystyrene. And then there's the urethane insulations. And I generally like to use the closed cell extruded polystyrene, okay? And then, so going with that material, then how much and where to put it. Typically in Iowa, I would say four to six inches on the roof, okay? And it, it'll vary, you know, right. depending on your budget, whether you want to go a little bit more, a little bit less. And then generally running anywhere from three to four inches about halfway down the wall, okay? And then at that point, I usually recommend a one inch thickness or three quarters inch thickness to the base of the footing. Okay, the next question is about insulating underneath the floor slab. Typically what I recommend is to insulate about four feet back from the front, from the south face of the structure, underneath the floor slab. The rest of the floor I would refrain from insulating. Now the only time I would insulate is if I had an exposed concrete floor or a tile floor where I have young children crawling on the floor. Okay, then I might consider insulating under some of those spaces if I had a young child that was at that stage in life where they're, you know, crawling on the floor. Generally, I insulate back about four feet from the front, and then the rest of the structure is not insulated. Remember, if you put carpeting on your floor, that essentially is a somewhat of an insulator. Insulation, and of course, yeah. if you're trying to use passive techniques of bringing in the energy from the outside and you're insulating your entire floor with carpeting because that's essentially what you're doing you're really not going to achieve the passive benefits you know that theoretically most people say that you can achieve that can also affect the cooling in the summer is that right that's right it can also affect the cooling if you want to use a situation and some people call it the wicking effect where the earth essentially pulls heat out of the structure in the summertime if the, your entire structure is carpeted and all the walls are furred out, then you're really not going to be able to pull the heat out of the structure like you could as if you plastered or just directly glued sheetrock onto the wall. Thanks, Brent. Field reporter Marty Brown and I recently took a closer look at an earth-sheltered home and talked with the owners. Marty? This earth-sheltered home near Marshalltown, Iowa, was designed and co-built by the host of the Energy Savers, Jacob Quinlog. Jacob, tell us some details about the home. How large is it? Well, Marty, this is a, an 1,100 square foot three bedroom home. It's primarily constructed with poured concrete walls, but it does have a precast concrete roof, which was brought in on a truck and set with a crane. Uh, the entire structure is insulated on the outside. You can see the retaining walls that are on both the east and the west end of the building, which keep the earth bermed up against the, the side walls of the building to give it more of the earth protection. Uh, a couple of things you, you might also notice, uh, the only puncture in the roof of this building is for the ventilation system, uh, which is very important in an earth sheltered building that they be well ventilated. 
Also, you can see the, the chimney for the fireplace. In this case, this was put outside the wall of the building uh, to minimize one more puncture through the roof. I see. What did the site look like before you started? Uh, it was a gently sloping south slope. Uh, we had to dig into it about six feet, uh, build the house, and then use the excavation earth to cover over the building. A uh, sloped site isn't absolutely necessary, but it does help the construction a little bit if you do have a gentle south slope. We also oriented the building to solar south, and at this site, that's about six degrees east of compass south, so that it would get maximum solar radiation. An important feature in the passive design for summer cooling is the solar overhang. In this particular case, it's about 41 inches long, uh, and it was designed to keep the sun completely out of the windows from April 21st to August 21st. Now, how much uh, maintenance is involved on the outside of a house like this? Well, that depends a lot on what you skin the exterior with, but uh, obviously the side walls and the roof require zero exterior maintenance. It's primarily the south wall. In this case, uh, because of the budget we were working with, uh, wood paneling was placed over the styrofoam insulation, which is then on the outside of the concrete. As we said before, all the insulation on the house is on the outside. Uh, so beneath the siding, you have insulation about three inches, which goes all the way to the footing, and then the concrete underneath. The windows in this case are polyvinyl chloride coated, so they never need painted. The color is permanently embedded in the finish, uh, and we did that just for the exterior maintenance reasons. You might notice the retaining walls have been uh, painted, they wouldn't have to be, and that is one thing he will have to uh, continue to maintain. But generally, maintenance can be kept almost to a minimum, uh, almost to zero on houses like this. So from a cost standpoint, that makes a house like this particularly attractive? Then. Yeah, in addition to the energy saving and the protection, you've got low future costs for maintaining the outside. So Jacob, this is the source of all the heat that the sun doesn't provide, right? Yeah, this is the only backup heating source in this home. There is no conventional furnace of any kind. Uh, they use this two or three times a week to maintain the balance of the heat, which wasn't supplied by the sun. Uh, another addition to the heating system is uh, this grill right here. There's a small blower in the utility room, which will suck heat down the wall from this grill and under the floor to the back rooms of the house. So since this is at w one end of the building, uh, we could see this end getting plenty warm from the the wood stove and not getting the heat to the other end very easily so we put that duct system under the floor. Mm -hmm. A couple other things I might mention here uh, this is directly uh, plastered concrete there is no sheetrock or anything here and that lets the heat from either source either the stove or the sun readily be accepted into the walls where it can be held in storage and released. The same way with the ceiling the ceiling is directly textured on the precast concrete panels. Uh, I might talk about insulation a little bit this house has four inches of rigid polystyrene insulation on the top, uh, two inches down four feet, and one inch the remainder. Uh, additional insulation could be added at the top two feet of the building, since we know most of the heat loss in underground structures is through the roof and the top two or three feet of the sidewalls. Uh, the floor is insulated back four feet from the front wall or the south wall with two inches of insulation, and the rest of the floor is left uninsulated. These are sliding insulated window panels, which the barns pull over the windows at night uh, to keep the heat from escaping back out through the glass. They consist of uh, an inch of rigid foam insulation with wood paneling on either side. Uh, they then open them first thing in the morning, allow the sun to come in, and repeat the process every day. Uh, and they've noticed it makes a big difference not only in the heat loss, but in the comfort that they experience while living next to the, the large window areas. I'm with Dennis and Kathy Barnes, the owners of this earth-sheltered home. So how many are in your family? There are four of us. And is, is the home comfortable? Yes, it is. It's real quiet and real comfortable. It maintains such an even temperature that it just, you just don't notice any fluctuation in heat or cold. How is your heat provided in the winter? Well, 90% we've calculated is from the passive solar design of the house. And we pick up the other 10% through a wood-burning stove, and uh, it, it's real efficient. Uh, my wife uses it maybe once every three days. So how much did you end up spending on heating bills this last winter? Well, we didn't spend anything last winter because uh, I pick up wood from the local factory for nothing, and I used two small pickup loads last year. And but... I, I've just got a small pickup, so we didn't use very much wood. Does the house stay pretty cool in the summer? 
did, it did uh, real good this summer up until late uh, late August, and uh, then it started getting pretty hot and humid in here. So, if you had it to do all over again, what would you do differently next time? We'd probably make it a quite a bit bigger, uh, make the bedrooms bigger, and and uh, put in more storage area because we kind of miss it being just a one level. You kind of miss your other level, so that's one of the things we do. And Kathy, as mother of two, how is it living in a house like this? When I thought of a or sheltered home, I thought of a cave. I thought they just put a hole in the ground and you know, <laughs> like the. Uh, Cavemen, you know, but I thought it'd be dark and, you know, um, with no light or, but with the uh, windows as big as they are and with the sun shining in there in the wintertime, it's really, it really heats up good and I really like it now. Thank you for letting us see your house today. We're back in the studio with Brent Anderson. Brent, the inevitable last question, financing. Uh, because not very many earth sheltered houses have been sold, there's a real question about the resale value of them. Uh, what would you recommend to a person just about ready to go in to seek financing uh, that they do uh, to, to ensure their success at achieving financing for an or sheltered home? I think probably the first thing that I would do is when I go to the banker would have a, a good set of working drawings, one that probably an architect or an engineer has looked at, perhaps as stamped. Many times they'll require the stamp or an approval. The second thing is that if the builder has no knowledge at all what earth sheltered housing is, I would probably try to be working with a builder who would went before and talked to him about it, okay? And um, I think that talking to the banker before or going to the banker with your builder right there, you know, someone that has a good reputation in town as a good quality builder will really help in trying to get, you know, achieve the financing. I hope you can be with us next week when we will discuss active solar heating systems on the energy savers. Energy Savers was made possible in part by a grant from the South Dakota Energy Office. <laughs>